So randomized control trial to isolate the effects of fasting and energy restriction on weight loss and metabolic health in lean adults. Science translational medicine. So this is very important because first of all, let me just say that I am a proponent of intermittent fasting and uh, time-restricted eating. Uh, I think I actually just made a video on like what were the steps that I would take if I had to start over in 2025. Um, because I used to weigh 80 pounds. So like if I gained 80 pounds and I had to start that whole process over again, what were some of the, the some of the steps that I would take? And one of the first ones that I would do is that I would practice intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. Um, and I think because I already did that, I practiced that for about eight years and I had a lot of really good success on it. And so um, I'm definitely in its corner. However, with the popularity, the rise in popularity of intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating comes the people that... Uh, sort of pretend that it's some sort of magic thing that's it's uh doing all of the things that it's doing regardless of energy restriction just in a nutshell before we get into all that and any energy restriction in order for you to lose weight you need to restrict the amount of energy coming into the system or you need to burn more calories than you're consuming that's the easiest way to think of it um, if you don't then you will store you will gain you will add tissue to your frame the only way to lose tissue is to burn more calories than you're than you're consuming. And so it's long been thought that regardless of energy restriction, you could intermittent fast or time restricted or, or practice time restricted eating, eat in a caloric surplus or at maintenance and still lose weight. And, you know, there's been those of us that have been sort of saying, well, hold on a second, because there's been, I mean, at this point, there's been study after study after study that's shown that when you compare maintenance calories um, and you have groups that are fasting versus not fasting, the fat loss is no different. It's all the same. And so what typically ends up happening is that you'll have the fasting camp or the time-restricted eating camp will say, oh, well, it's really autophagy. That's the big uh, important denominator there, where if you're not familiar with what autophagy is, autophagy is like a, a cellular cleanup and recycling mechanism where, I mean, right now you have waste and dead cells floating all over your body, on your skin, all up inside of your guts. It's just It's flipping gross inside of your body right now. And without autophagy, which by the way, autophagy happens just with calorie restriction. Okay. So you don't need fasting in order for that process to occur. But so when you have autophagy occurring, you have proteins and other cells going around and cleaning that stuff up, gobbling it up, uh, becoming supercharged cells, uh, converting the, uh, the tissues and the resources to various different processes, essentially just making you a healthier you getting rid of the clutter and the debris to make sure every all systems are go, all systems are running smoothly. And so for the longest time, it was said that, okay, yeah, the fat loss is the same, but autophagy is better with fasting groups. And hey, I've certainly been guilty of saying that myself. I 100% have said that. And so this is actually something I've changed my mind on as time has passed. Like I said, it's been eight years. And so this study, I think, is the first of its kind that I know of that actually looked at markers of autophagy. Now, there are a lot of markers of autophagy, and this one only looked at two. Um, so who knows? It could come out later that uh, there are other markers of autophagy that are, are more affected by time-restricted eating. We'll see. But it's not typically when I'm looking at this stuff, I'm like, okay, as time goes on, are we getting more confident or less confident of a specific thing? And it seems like as time goes on, and as we get more and more data, we're getting less confident that intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating are anything special. Um, we're getting more confident that it really is just the caloric restriction part of time-restricted eating that is the most important thing of it all. It's sort of the crux of it. So real quick, study design, 36 lean healthy participants were divided into three groups for three weeks. And the groups either followed daily energy restriction, which is classified as 75% of their maintenance calories. So that means if they were eating 2000 calories, if their maintenance was 2000 calories, they're eating 1500 calories. Okay. Their second group was an alternate day fasting group with energy restriction, so 24 hour fast. And then on the day that they weren't fasting, the day that they were eating, they're eating 150% of maintenance calories. And so that's sort of designed to mimic the daily energy restriction, the 75 each day. If you take two days at 150% of maintenance calories, that equates to 75% each day. And so what that's looking to do is essentially like, hey, these people are fasting and they're restricting their calories, which is it the daily energy restriction or is it the fasting that's having the biggest impact? And then they also did alternate day fasting as a third group, 
with no energy restriction. So very similar to the second group, it was a, a zero calories on the fasting day, 200% of maintenance calories on the feeding day. And so what ended up happening was that, well, here's the weight loss results. Daily energy restriction, 75% of maintenance calories led to significant weight loss of 1.9 kgs or 4.21 pounds with most of that coming from fat loss. 3.86 of that, 3.86 pounds of that came from fat. That's huge. 4.21 pounds of weight loss, 3.86 pounds of that from fat. That's most of it. And then we have the alternate day fasting with energy restriction. And that was, again, not eating anything on one day and then eating 150% of their calories on another day. And that caused weight loss, 3.53 pounds of weight loss, but with less fat loss. Now get this, only 1.63 pounds of that 3.53 pounds was from fat. So that means that almost two pounds of the weight that they lost was from lean tissue. Now I'll throw a caveat in there. When we fast, one of the things that ends up happening is that we, we do become dehydrated. Um, lack of carbohydrate coming into the system, lack of electrolytes coming into the system makes it more difficult for us to hold on to water. So it could be possible that some of the weight that they lost was actually from water. Very possible. I don't know. But the fact remains that even if it was, then that means all around they lost less weight than just the daily energy restriction group. Um, and that's very important. And then the alternate day fasting without energy restriction, so zero calories on one day and then 200% of maintenance calories on another day, had minimal weight loss, 1.15 pounds. That might sound like a lot, but over three weeks, that's not a lot. That's, that's nothing, you know? Um, and then negligible fat loss. So clearly the daily energy restriction group was more effective for weight loss and more effective for most of that weight coming from fat. Um, other things that they checked were post-meal metabolism, gut hormones, uh, gene expression and fat tissue, and none of that was significantly different. The big thing here though, so restricting energy intake via alternate day fasting, so zero on one day and then 150% maintenance, resulted in a compensatory reduction in physical activity thermogenesis primarily due to reduced spontaneous light and moderate intensity movements, whereas no such reduction in calories and in activity were apparent during daily energy restriction or alternate day fasting without energy restriction. So this is very important because what this is talking about is there's something called NEAT, non-exercise non activity thermogenesis. And essentially what that is, is how much you fidget when you're just kind of standing around or sitting around watching a movie, I'm sure. You know people that just cannot sit still for the life of them, constantly shifting their weight around, they're constantly tapping and moving their leg and just doing all kinds of stuff, getting up, sitting back down. And then there's people that actually sit really, really still. So the person that moves a lot, they burn a lot more calories on average than the person that sits still. And I mean, there are some estimates that it's as high as almost a thousand calories per day, more than the person that sits still. And so what this is talking about is your body has a, comp a compensatory effect where when you stop eating, your body will slow things down to conserve energy because it knows. I mean, it doesn't, your, your body knows if you're in a situation that you're going to be starving for a while, it doesn't want to waste energy because who knows when the next meal could be coming in. And so subconsciously, it slows you down. You'll do less fidgeting. You'll have, you know, you'll talk less, you'll get up less. And those things all uh, make a really dramatic difference on the amount of calories burned. So that could, it probably does in fact, account for why the daily energy restriction group had such better results than the alternate day fasting group. Um, that's something to take into account. Now, autophagy. Now this was the big one. Um, now they measured two, two different things. They measured sirtuin one gene and they measured insulin-like growth, growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor was slightly upregulated in the daily energy restriction group and was slightly downregulated in the fasting group, but it was not statistically significant. They were very, very close to each other. The big thing is that sirtuin-1 was similar in all groups. And so when sirtuin-1 gene is uh, upregulated, it's responsible for, it's a primary uh, marker for autophagy because what it is responsible for is sort of activating uh proteins around the body to to participate in that autophagy process. Without sirtuin-1 gene, 
the process, it will be very hard for it to start in a nutshell. So you have acetylated proteins all over your body and that acetyl group is essentially shutting down those proteins and stopping them from doing, from participating in autophagy. And what sirtuin one does is it cleats that off. It gets rid of it. It's called deacetylation. And so when you deacet, when you deacetylate these proteins, now they're activated. Now they're free to do all kinds of different processes, but now they're actually participating in that autophagy, um, in that autophagy process. And this is important because people will say, oh, well, autophagy is upregulated more during time restricted eating. Sure. But it's also upregulated more during calorie restriction in the first place. So is it that it's upregulated more during fasting because fasting is magic? Or is it upregulated more during fasting because fasting puts you in a caloric deficit? And my, my answer is that it's the latter, clearly. And time and time again, things keep showing this. So again, we'll see if there's more studies out there that pop up that uh, maybe they start to look at different uh, markers of, of autophagy, because I think they should, you know, again, just it's important to open up lines of communication and talk about this type of stuff. The more people that talk about it, the more people that shine a light on these studies, the more awareness it is, the more scientists get a hold of it, and they start coming up with new creative study designs and, and looking at different uh, new things. So hopefully scientists keep digging into this and eventually we'll get a study where they look at all of the markers of autophagy. Probably won't ever be all, but if we can get more, I'm happy with that. So this was, uh, I was really happy to see this, this study, but the conclusion here is that daily energy restriction is more effective than alternate day fasting for reducing body fat, period. Um, and I've known that most people in the fitness community know that, but it's unfortunate that there's sort of this, uh, there's this thing that happens where when people are new to health and fitness, they latch on to things like this. And again, that's not to say that fasting is bad. I'm a proponent of fasting. And I think people should, I think it's a very useful tool in the very beginning when people first start learning how to restrict their calories, fasting is a great tool for that. But unfortunately, when people first start a health and fitness journey, they are dogmatic about um, these certain topics, keto, carnivore, intermittent fasting, all these different things. And there's a saying, just because you know something doesn't mean you understand something. So you might hear something and there might be parts of that something that are true, but until you've done the digging and, and just sat and chewed on the topic for a long time, years then you don't understand the different interactions between different foods, different proteins, different compounds, different, you know, there's all these different things where it's not just one dimensional. Okay. So it's really important whenever you hear something, always do your own research, always preaching that even with what I'm saying to you right now, do your own research, look it up for yourself, but also don't get carried away on these fads. Okay. And a lot, I know that a lot of these diets can make you feel good. And again, I'm guilty of saying this myself, intermittent fasting, I felt great, right? When I did keto, I felt great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. I was just talking to Les, my mentor in another episode in year special released on the 24th, talking about how cortisol feels good. Cortisol is meant to activate you and, and get you out there in the world. But what do you keep hearing? Cortisol is bad. Cortisol is the stress hormone. So to have cortisol chronically activated is bad for your body. Well, guess what? When you're constantly fasting, cortisol is chronically activated. When you're constantly in ketosis and your body's relying on gluconeogenesis to turn amino acids to glucose, cortisol is constantly elevated. That's not good. So just because a process in the body is possible doesn't mean that it's efficient doesn't mean that that's what your body is supposed to be doing. So those are my thoughts on that fasting study was really interesting. And I hope we get more data.